Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Glenn Carlson. You're listening or watching The Dent Podcast. And in this conversation, I speak to the author of Add Then Multiply. Uh, David Horn has raised over 100 million pounds in funding through debt and equity. He's bought and sold more than 20 different businesses himself and on behalf of other people. Background as a CFO, left the corporate world, started his own entrepreneurial ventures. And let me just read you this this great quote. David is instrumental in helping me achieve 25X growth in sales and 11X growth in profits in three years. But the trick of this book is it's not about sales and marketing. It's about how to acquire businesses and grow your own business using acquisition as a strategy. His four part model, fund, acquire, consolidate and exit is essentially the backbone of the book uh, and we get into it. David's been our CFO in Dent for many years now and this is a guy that really understands the idea behind adding value into a business and then being able to multiply your value off that. While most business owners are thinking of growth through sales, marketing, new territories, new products, David brings in a very fresh approach. We talk about all sorts of stuff acquisitions, we talk about where do you get the money from, we talk about the culture fit, we talk about some of the nuanced details that would make that profitable uh, and possible across a few different industries. We also talk about random stuff like his journey of becoming author, speaker, TEDx talker. We start the podcast with a whole conversation around uh, diversity in fundraising. His TEDx talk is on the topic of the fight for fairer funding, where predominantly the vast majority of all funding goes, funnily enough, to white males. And he's on a mission to be able to balance the scales, to be able to create a fairer and more level playing field for not just women, but all minority groups. And there's a, a cool kind of conversation that we kick off with. So enough from me, ladies and gentlemen, my name's Glenn Carlson, and I'm looking forward to introducing you to David Horn. Mate, David Horn. Thank you for joining me on the podcast, mate. Pleasure to be here, Glenn. We finally make it happen. I was just talking to you in the green room. I think you're the most postponed guest, not due to any lack of caliber, of course, quite the opposite. Um, just a, one of those series of unfortunate events. So, mate, I'm, I'm stoked you're here. Could you uh, explain for our listeners maybe where, whereabouts you are right now? So whereabouts I am, uh, geographically, I'm in London uh, and in sure? terms of business, in terms of business, uh, I run two businesses. Um, I run a business called Add Then Multiply, which works exclusively with founders of companies who are looking to scale up through raising capital and growing by acquisition. So going out and buying other companies, whether that's buying a competitor or buying a supplier or buying a, a company that's you know in a similar sector to, uh, that they're in to, to scale that up. Um, it is the fastest way to grow. Um, and uh, it's something that I've been doing over the last 20 years. Um, and then my other business is called Funding Focus, and this is something I've been working on for the last two and a half years. This all came about when I was speaking at an event in uh, the UK, and a woman came up to me after my talk and said, why does so little venture capital funding go to women? And I kind of looked and thought, I have no idea. But I said I'd find out. And about a week later, I had a meeting with the chief executive of the British Business Bank. Uh, she and I had met at a, a networking function, and this was just a, a, a scheduled follow-up meeting. And we had a very pleasant conversation. And towards the end of the chat, I thought, well, I'll ask her if she knows anything about it. And so I said, do you know anything about this issue of funding for female entrepreneurs? And she smiled and reached into the bottom drawer of her desk and pulled out a bound research report called UK, <laughs> UK VC and Female Founders. Wow. And okay. it's about a what 60 page full scope research report that looked into every venture capital deal done in the UK in 2017. And they found that all female teams submitted 5% of the pitch decks and got less than 1% of the money. Mixed gender teams submitted 20% of the pitch decks and got 10% of the money. And all male teams submitted 75% of the pitch decks and got more than 89% of the money. So there's clearly a skew going on. And so I thought, okay, I want to look into this and research it more. And um, 
during the noughties, so from 2003 until 2010, I was the CFO of a couple of companies listed on the London Stock Exchange. So I have some friends at the Stock Exchange and I was having a, a coffee meet with one of them. And we were chatting about this report. And all of a sudden I remembered, hey, you guys have a really cool theater. Because uh, I remember doing presentations there. Do you think we could put on an event at the Stock Exchange? And, and so there was a bit of cajoling and deal making. And, and in the end, they sponsored it and gave us the venue. And so in November of 2019, we had over 100 people at this event in the London Stock Exchange um, coming to hear the stories of women who had successfully raised money. And that was kind of the beginning. And over the last two years, I've been on the most incredible journey of discovery of just how unfair the fundraising world is. And uh, so I'm, I'm curious because you mentioned unfair. So there's definitely a you, you found that there's definitely some form of a prejudice or a bias. I, or I, I think bias is the appropriate term. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So yeah. dig into it. Like it wasn't where I was going to start, but I definitely wanted to cover it. So let's let, let's get in. Like, What have you what have you discovered? Because obviously those those numbers uh, will suck. Yeah, <laughs> they suck big time. So, I mean, there, there have been, I mean, coming out of the event that we held two years ago, I learned two main things at that point. One, this isn't just a UK problem. It's a global issue. We had comments from people in 10 countries around the world on our social media actually commenting uh, about saying, hey, you know, we've got the same issue, uh, ranging from sort of Australia, Belgium, France, Germany, Canada, China, US, South Africa, so all over the place. Uh, the other thing I discovered is it isn't actually a women versus men issue. It's white guys and everyone else. Um, right. Because men who come from different racial backgrounds face the same challenges, um, as obviously do women. And, and I've just been reading more into this and, and digging up all the research. I'm currently writing my second book all about this issue. That's going to come out in, uh, in 2022. And um, I mean, some of the stats that I could peel off. So in the United States, it's a little better than in the UK. Uh, female teams are getting between two and 3% of funding. Um, but there was a fascinating research report that I read recently uh, that came out of the UK that between 2009 and 2019, so over a 10-year period, only 10 Black female founders successfully raised venture capital. And is there any, uh, so I'm not trying to in any way, obviously there's a there's a problem and I'm, I'm just trying to understand it because, yeah. you know, statistics tell a very, you know, narrow story often because, yes. you know, you got to, well, how many applied? And, you know, if there's, oh, how, how many are actually involved in the, in, you know, I would just, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to navigate, but it's like, is it just that there's a lot more white men pitching for money? And um, with version not rate just, I mean, if you, go back, if you go back to the British Business Bank stats, all, yeah. women, all female teams submitted 5% of the decks and only got 1% of the money. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so yes, more men are pitching. The other thing that the, the, other thing that the evidence- getting the, disproportionate. Exactly. Um, Okay. Yeah. And how far back do you need to go? Like, you know, was there any, was it a, a, the ability to break down, like, like has there been any de-genderfying of the decks to kind of go and looking back at those decks that the women submitted and, and having someone not know whether it was a man or a woman and go, well, that's a shit hit pitch. It's just not a very good pitch and then it's like oh it was a it was a, a, a female one or a male one do, do you know what i mean like taking that bias out to see I, if i know exactly what you mean there, there was a study that was reported on in the harvard business review i think it was four or five years ago that was kind of the flip side of that they gave people the exact same pitch deck to present and it was just a voice presenting you couldn't see the person yeah. who was presenting it was just a voice yeah. But it was exactly the same deck, and male presenters got way more uh, positive votes from the venture capitalists than female presenters. Yeah, that sucks, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, like when, when you break it down, and it's not just a, a skew due to you know normal, I suppose, reasons. But when you really discover there's a true bias, yeah. In it. So you're obviously writing a book on it. Like, where is it coming from? Is it just 
you know, is it sort of tribalism? White men <laughs> trust white men. Yeah, uh, I, know, I, mean, I mean, I mean, I've anything I, we've discovered in the last two years, we like our tribes, right? Definitely. And there's no question that there is a tribal thing around that. You know, I've seen articles coming out that say, you know, what are the top universities that venture capitalists went to? And it's Cambridge, Oxford, Harvard, Stanford, MIT. And yeah. what are the top universities that successful founders went to? And it's Cambridge, Oxford, Stanford, Harvard, MIT. So, so there's definitely that sort of, a, oh, you know, I like the cut of your jib. You went to the same school as me kind of thing. Um, I think I would like to believe it's not widespread misogyny or racism, yeah. Um, but I believe very strongly that it's just it's cognitive bias and people aren't even aware. Um, and as part of the research for the book, I um, I interviewed a guy. And again, it's, it's kind of funny how these how these things all happen. Um, I, I was I was speaking at an event a couple of years ago and, and all of the speakers were at one table at lunch one day. And I sat next to this guy who was one of the keynote speakers. And it turns out that he's a professor at uh, University College London, and his field of specialism is cognitive bias. Mm. So we had a we had a conversation around that, and I've since had a number of meetings with him, and he's very kindly let me use some of his research and his IP um, in the book to to, to help explain uh, the situation. And in addition to that, I I came across another. Um, bit of study from a woman who's now a, uh, an assistant professor at London Business School. She did her PhD studies at Columbia in New York, and she looked at all of the pitches um, from the tech crunch disrupt pitch competition in New York over a 10 year period and broke down and analyzed all of the language that was used. And, and then she studied the types of questions that were asked. And there are generally two types of questions. There's what's called a promotion question and a prevention question. So a promotion question might be, um, how are you going to double your market share in the next year? And a prevention question will be, how are you going to stop your competitors from stealing your customers? 66% mm. of the questions asked of male entrepreneurs were promotion. And 67% of the questions asked of female entrepreneurs were prevention. Weird. And what was really interesting was it didn't matter the gender of the investor asking. So both male and female investors were asking more preventive questions of women than of men. Any idea why, like where that comes from? <sighs> I don't know. I've got, an inter I've got an interview with this professor in, in, in a couple of weeks. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm going to try and drill into that with her and, and, and see if she's been able to find out anything more on that. The other thing that was really interesting, though, she said, if you were asked, and this applied to both men and women, if you were asked a preventive question and you responded in a promotion style, you were much more likely to get investment. So tell me, you know, how are you going to protect your, your, your customers from, from competition? Well, we're going to do this, but actually we're going to focus on growing our business this way and we're going to do this to grow and we're going to do that to grow. Those kind of responses, so a positive response to a negative question led to a much better outcome. Kind of like when, when politicians don't answer the question. <laughs> Is if you go if you go on stereotypes, you know you could look at a lot of pure capitalism, which is very masculine, misogyn, like you know, profit at all costs, exploit human and natural resources, you know, yep. rip and tear, and you know, it's been the it's been the history of imperialism, the history of capitalism, like it, it tends to be how um, how that works because to, to play at the elite levels of that game, you know, is vicious. Um, sort it, of a it, it, it is vicious. Yeah, it, it can be right. vicious. It can be vicious. And 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 again, I think you know one of one of the right? Sorry, and, and highly competitive, right? Yeah, and and one of the one of the issues that I think is is causing it is you know there is a, there is an absolute wall of money piling into venture capital right now. It's insane the amounts of money. I think this year so far just under a hundred billion dollars in the USA has come newly into the venture capital industry. Hmm. Um, but venture capitalists are obsessed with finding the next unicorn hmm. because their whole model is based on, we're going to invest in a bunch of businesses at an early stage. We know some of them are going to fail. 
We know some of them are going to go sideways and we're going to hope that one or two of them take off and pay back the fund and returns and everything. And, and so everyone is just out there chasing the next unicorn. And I think a lot of businesses that are run by female founders, they're good, successful businesses, but, but they don't want to yeah. scale that greasy pole and hit that, you know, cutthroat world that you talked about. You know, they want to build a good, solid business. This was as part of what I was gonna gonna ask because, you know, the moment you get into these conversations, you know, this is kind of this is the area of getting cancelled if you say the wrong thing, right? Which is total <laughs> total nonsense because how do you just have a how do you have a nuanced conversation? Yeah. But my intuition of you know um, certain men that I know and certain women that I know, men tend to be attracted to more hyper competitive sort of environments. Women don't. Women want to find a way to collaborate. They want to find a way to do it in a different way. doesn't mean it can't be very successful, but they just, yep. my experience is they do it in a different way. Given the world that you're in, do you find, A, do you find that to be true or is that my own bias? And B, do you think the funding architecture is biasing that kind of dominant, masculine, competitive trait which is showing up in that like that that assertive language as opposed to um potentially more of a collaborative mm. type of a language and that could be where the skew is coming from because i yeah. mean i look at i look at capitalism i look at the world i look at business eating the world i look at business exploiting human and natural resources i mean i'm an entrepreneur i'm a business owner but i look at what it does at scale without uh conscience Right, without without in, uh, without seeking to include all the externalities that tend to get externalized at, at scale way off the balance sheet. And I'm like, man, there just needs to be way more women <laughs> that yeah. that aren't being forced to play this male's the wrong word, but this masculine game, this hyper competitive win at all costs game, because it doesn't seem to be serving anyone except you know the very wealthy elite you know if we if we yep. consider what is business for well it should be to solve meaningful problems absolutely you know, to address issues in the world to create employment to offer services but to do so in a way that works as a a collaborative ecosystem as opposed to kind of like the winner take all game siphon wealth up into the top 0.001% type maneuver. So I, I really think there needs to be more of that feminine, inclusive, holistic approach. If I can say that again, without sounding, um, I guess, without generalizing too much, there definitely needs yeah. to be a shift, I think, in the, um, in the way in which business done is done. But if the funding for that, so the mechanisms that allow that to happen is systemically biased to the old paradigm, how do you break that? Yep. Um, that's what I'm working on with my team to try and figure out now. And, uh, and uh, you know, we've, we've, over the last two years, we've run a series of events. Um, we've built up a database of over a thousand entrepreneurs in 30 odd countries around the world. We're on six continents. So if any of your listeners know any, any entrepreneurs in Antarctica, please have them get in touch and then we'll be on all seven continents. But um, yeah, no, I, I think, I think you've kind of two main themes there. Um, one, and, and this is really going into, you know, our history as a species where you know, 10,000, 100,000 years ago, out, out in the wilds, typically the men were the hunter-gatherers and the women were more the carers and, and, the, and the sustainers, as it were. And I, I think there is an element of that that still comes through. Um, but our society today is less and less accepting of those um, stereotypical uh, characterizations of men and women. And so, so I think, you know, there, there's, there's a distinct shift. And I would, I would say, based on the research that I've been doing in the last three to five years, there's been a lot more attention paid to this uh, than ever was previously. 
And, um, you know, there's a, there, there are a number of funds that have come up uh, in, in the UK. There's now um, three or four funds that I'm aware of that invest exclusively uh, in female founders. Uh, there's one fund that in, in invests exclusively uh, in black founders. Uh, so there are, there are steps happening to move things in the direction. Um, and there are there are things sort of happening in, in, in the governance side of things. So the, the, the Venture Capital Association and the Business Angels Association are signing up to sort of a, a there's a, a thing that the UK government put out called the Investing in Women Code. Um, but I fear that a lot of them are just sort of, you know, oh yeah, well, I'll tick that box and then yeah. we'll carry on doing what we normally do. Yeah. Look at my wonderful virtue signaling, looking after, you know, uh, I wonder, right? Because I always and look, this is I am so far out of my depth. This is not an area that I have, you know, really any degree of, you know, expertise in. But, um, you know, wh- when there's like awards for women only or you know black only or whatever, like minority only, um, and I can imagine funding for women only or minority only in in any way, shape, or form, I, I can't help feel that that can't be the solution because that is like in its nature, it's sexist, right? Now I understand there needs to be potentially some mechanisms to, to create an equilibrium, but I, I just, what was going through my mind is, and again, I'm not, I'm not sure what my first premises even need to be here. Right. But if you were to consider if there's merit in the fact that men and women would have different styles, they would bring a different energy, a different intention to business. Yeah. Right? I don't think that's unreasonable that there would be some differences in the way they would, they would Definitely. do that. Um, and I wonder if, I wonder if you familiar with B Corp. Yes. Yes. So I wonder if you got a bunch of investors, right. That were committed to funding B Corp businesses or, or businesses that have a business plan that included B Corp, which is, you know, full stack sustainability the whole way through, yep. Yep. right? And then you've got a bunch of men and women out there competing for that money. I wonder if the same skew would exist. Mm. That's a really good question because, I mean, I, I, we're actually going through B Corp certification right now with the funding focused business. Um, and so we've done all of the pre-assessment and we're waiting for the, I mean, there's a huge backlog. It takes, I think, six months, but we're waiting for that to be, to be done. But yeah, you know, we had to go through and, and talk about what are we doing in terms of giving back? What are we doing in terms of sustainability? Um, all of that. And if you've got a if you've got a cutthroat investor that it's just like I want a return on my dollars and I want the highest return possible, and you've got a uh, a dude that's just like kick the door off the hinges, I'll rip heads off, I'll do whatever it takes to mm-hmm. win, right? And it's like, oh, what would you do with these competition? I'll destroy them, right? <laughs> you know, and it's like, oh, fantastic, let's fund this guy, yeah. and then. A woman comes in and it's like she doesn't have that energy. She's just like, you know, we want to be really inclusive. We want to make sure we're taking into account people on the planet um, and we would prefer to slow our growth to make sure that, you know, we're not producing our product in a sweatshop that has to have nets around the building to stop people killing themselves, but it might add an extra five years to the return. And it's like, well, bum, bum. as opposed to, Right. And so it sort of skews to this idea of women and men, as opposed to maybe it's not about women and men. Maybe it's actually about the business, the, the nature of the business model and the intention behind the investing. Yeah, that's definitely the case. And, and, and you know, one of the issues is, um, particularly if you look at the venture capital and private equity model, is they tend to raise a fund and they'll commit to their investors to repay the fund in a five to seven year period. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, it, I was talking to one guy recently and he was, he was saying, it's, it's almost like as soon as the ink is dry on signing the investment agreement, the conversation turns to, right, when are we going to exit? Yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 and yet, you know, you look at someone like Warren Buffett and, and Warren Buffett, his, his ideal holding period, he says, is forever. He mm. likes to find wonderful businesses and buy them and hold them. And, um, you know, I, I think that's a much more sustainable model. And so 
I, I think part of the issue is caused by the fact that the way that the venture capital industry raises money and says to its investors, you know, you have to lock them in for a period because you're dealing with illiquid investments in, in you know, small startups, privately held companies. But you reach a point where do you have to have all of the money back or, or would you be happy to, you know, have a have a portfolio of, 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 a, of a stream of income coming from successful businesses? I wonder if there are any funds or any funds or uh, VCs or, you know, um, or pit, even pitching things like you're talking about that are more in the, the sustainability space or that have a bias towards sustainability to see if that skews the numbers of winning deals between men and women because, of course, now all of a sudden what would be amazing is if it was inverted. What would be amazing is if actually a higher percentage of women got it because their approach to that sort of a business model that's actually going to be sustainable for all stakeholders, including yeah. people, including the planet, including everything, yeah. um, as opposed to often the omni-focus that, well, certainly I as a, as a dude find myself often having just you know, um, tunnel vision sometimes. Um, that would be that would be cool, and then that would that would trigger more of a broader conversation around. You know, my dream would be, my dream would be that it's not about men and women. It's actually about uh, a, a an approach to business that is now outdated and needs to change. And this is just another. I agree, a hundred percent. Another, um, I guess, argument for that. Yeah, no, I, um, I agree 100%. And, and I mean, our, our mission statement is to level the uneven playing field yeah. um, so that basically everyone has an equal opportunity to get access to capital. Yeah. Because, you know, one, one of the key things is, and, and, and not everybody, not, not every business needs it and right. not every founder wants it. And, you know, I, I talk to some founders and they think, oh, yeah, it'd be great to raise capital. And, and then I talk to them about some of the, you know, day-to-day -day realities and you'll have someone else on your board and they're going to be asking you questions and, oh, no, I don't want any of that. Mm. And, and so, you know, you need, you need to understand what, what you're looking at when you raise capital. And I've, I've worked with people who've raised money and then realized that they and the investors don't get on well. And that, that is, can be really, really difficult. That brings me to um, add then multiply. I mean, just, just a few things for anyone that, that hasn't come across David before. Um, so John Van Kufler, uh, founder of Huvac, said David was an in David was instrumental in helping me achieve 25x growth in sales and 11x growth in profits in three years. That's a big deal. Yep. Um, Michael Neal, who creating the impossible and the inside out revolution, he said. An education in how big business works, written in a way that small business can understand and benefit from, like a mini MBA for the entrepreneur with epic dreams and a real desire to make them come true. You yourself have raised over 100 million pounds, bought and sold more than 20 different, or been involved in the, the buying and selling of over 20 different businesses. Um, where did the where did this book where, where did the sort of the spirit of this book originate? I remember saying to people when it came out, the book was 30 years in the making. Um, and, and then six months in the, in the writing and editing. Um, so I guess the genesis of it came from work that I did between 2000 and 2010, where I found myself as the CFO of three very different companies. One was a PR agency. Um, one was a digital media and publishing group. That's Huvo, the one that John uh, wrote about. And one was an online auctioneer of used industrial equipment. So totally different companies, but all three of them raised money and bought other companies. Mm. And it was just one of those things, you know, I, I, I didn't set out when I was 20 years old to say, this is what I want to go and do. It just, you know, life just kind of led me down that path. And, and, and one thing led to another thing led to another thing. And, 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 I, it, you know, it's really interesting when I, when I joined the PR agency, that was in the spring of 2000. So I had been working with big blue chip companies um, and I quit in late 1999 thinking I'm going to get a job with a dot com. Thank God I didn't because that, that whole thing was about to collapse. But I ended up landing this role with this PR agency. And 
they were very acquisitive. And all of a sudden I understood how to do deals. And then um, one of my co-direct, we, we, we then actually, our PR agency, our parent company got bought out by Interpublic Group, one of the great big giants of the media industry. And we got merged into their um, PR business and, and they already had a European CFO. So I got shown the door. But one of my co-directors at that agency knew John and introduced me to him. And as it turns out, John and Angela and I are having lunch today. Hmm. So, you know, you know how, you know how all the, all the bits and pieces of the universe come together. So may, maybe the fact that it's taken us so long to have this session is, 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 is a sign of that. So I met John and started working with John. And then I left his business because I got headhunted to join the auction house. And then I left that world at the end of 2010, following the, the global financial crash. Um, and I had a bit of a burnout and a midlife crisis and launched a wine business, which was fun, but not very successful. <laughs> and, and then I just, I just started working with entrepreneurs more and, and found out that I loved it. And then I came across Dan and, you know, did, did the KPI course and that just changed my thinking. And, 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 you know, the book came out of that really, but it was, it was like the distillation of all of that. And we were meant to have the chat. Yeah, you know, a year ago, which was just either just before or just after you won the Business Booker World Awards, which was which was pretty cool. So pretty much straight after launch of the book, you went and picked up a, a pretty prestigious uh, UK award. So let's let's unpack it a bit. Add then multiply. How small business can think like big business and achieve exponential growth. Now, of course, you're doing that through funding or acquisition. So instead of instead of growing through sales and marketing, you're talking about growing through uh, acquisition. Correct. You kind of, un- for, for someone that might be listening that's kind of unfamiliar with the concept of acquisition beyond, you know, something that super big businesses do. Sure. Um, could you unpack maybe a bit about that? And also just the name, add, then multiply. Like what's the, what does that mean? Okay. So add, then multiply. Um is a little bit of a play on uh, things. Um, I've, I've always had a slightly rebellious streak. And, and for anyone who remembers their, their um, mathematics in, in school, uh, there was an order of operations and you always multiplied before you added. Um, and so turning that on its head was kind of fun. Um, you are the, such the, a rebel. The, 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 name, the name actually came about when so so when I left the PR agency before I started working with John, I set up my own consultancy and I had a friend who was in design and stuff. So I said, just do me up a logo. And he did this logo that was like an eight pointed thing that in effect was an ad sign and a multiply sign on top of each other, but no differentiation. And then about 10 years later, I was having lunch with a friend of mine who's a, a, a branding genius. And I said, look, I, I, I want to re, you know, I want to, I want to reinvigorate this. Um, but, but, you know, it, it, it needs a complete facelift. And, and he was playing around with a bunch of different ideas and a bunch of different names. And he just came, he came up with ad then multiply. And I just went, that's genius. I love it. Perfect. And so, and, 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 and just to, to, to give a context to it in the, in how this applies in the world of, of acquisition is you add a company or a group of companies into your business and you will multiply what you get because you all of a sudden you've got your products and services and you've got another customer base that you can sell it to. You've got their customer base and you can sell them into your products and services. What's the smallest business you've, you've kind of navigated through an acquisition of another business? The smallest one was a deal I did earlier this year. Um, and it was a company that had sales of about 300,000 pounds. So about $500,000. Um, yeah. and, uh, that was a deal that was valued at about 300,000 pounds all in, in terms of the way the compensation was structured. There was some compensation up front and then some deferred. But they rolled into a bigger company. They rolled into a bigger company. Sorry, what's the size of the smallest bigger company? If you like, what, what's the what's the smallest size of an acquirer? Ah, uh, okay, okay. So yeah, so typically I work with companies that are uh, that have sales of at least a million pounds. Yeah, because anything less than that, it's oh. it's 
it's hard to it's hard to justify the scale. It's hard. You often won't necessarily have a, 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 a your team in place. One of the key things I talk about in the in the first section of the book is you know the importance of having a team. Um, and and many early stage businesses, you know, it might be one or two co-founders and then a, a bunch of people who are worker bees. Um, but as they scale up, they then have to bring in kind of that next layer of managerial expertise. And when you're going to do something like this, you need to have those kind of people in place because it's so when you're saying small business, where small business can think like big business and achieve exponential growth, you're probably talking, you know, small business, 20 employees minimum. Yeah. Um, 10 to 15 maybe, but yeah. Yeah. 10, yeah. 10 to 15 solid revenue, profitable, established executive layer, I suppose. Yeah. Usually, usually, you know, and, 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 and it might be, you know, so like a typical client might be, um, there's the founder who's the kind of the visionary out there sales guy, the big picture stuff, but not very good at the day to day. Um, but they've recognized that and they've brought in someone to, to kind of manage the sales and marketing function on a daily basis. They've brought in someone to manage the operations function. They've brought in someone to manage the finance function. You know, these aren't, these don't have to be director level people, but experienced, good, qualified people who, who the founder can trust and know that they're going to run those aspects of the business. Do you often come across people that have never even considered growth through acquisition and they kind of come across what you do and it's like, oh, whoa, like never thought about that before. Um, I only, I thought that was only for the big boys. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So walk us, walk, walk us, like walk me and some of our listeners through, through that story. Like how does that conversation start so he, here i'm here i am i'm doing you know a couple of million bucks or a million pounds or whatever i've got all those things you just talked about in place and you know, i'm telling you about the strategy are we going to do more sales and we're going to do more marketing and we're going to you know da, 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 and we're going to you know whatever it is i try to open up a new territory here and develop some new products here and you know maybe expand into a new market over there and you're like breaking the record going Burr! no 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 you're doing it all wrong it's like <laughs> exactly. I, 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 I had a I had a, an ex, a case exactly like that earlier this year where I had a client that wanted to expand geographically into a new country. And we sat down and, and looked at that country and then found out that actually he has a competitor in that country. And I said, well, why don't we approach them and see if they're interested in selling? And it turned out that the owners were in their mid to late 60s um, and were very interested in selling. Uh, unfortunately, that deal didn't go through because the owners had a very inflated expectation of what their business was worth. But it's exactly yeah. those kinds of things. So, so, and and you know, the 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 benefit of acquiring a business rather than entering a new territory is you go in and on day one you have customers, you have staff, you have contacts, you have a database, you have suppliers, you you have all of those things in existence. The challenge that you've got to do is how do you take someone else's business and culture and meld meld that in with your own? Yeah, and how how do you do that? Because I know that's one of the biggest issues, certainly with big business. When they do it, it's like a nightmare trying to trying to merge those things together. Yeah. The way we've done it at Dent, as you well know, we don't do that at all, and we let yeah. you know, any of the uh, businesses that roll up into the Dent Group just run their own show, which Things be working great for us, but for those that seem to want to merge it, what, what do you find as the the big pitfalls and and the solutions to that? I mean, at the end of the day, in something like this, it's all about people. It's all about getting the people in the company that you're buying on board, and and it can be particularly challenging when you're doing an acquisition of a competitor that you used to hate, and and they used to hate you. And all of a sudden, you know, that that can be a real issue. So I, I don't necessarily say buy out your 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 you know your fiercest competitor uh, because you can get into some some really challenging things there. But but if you if you want to look at entering a new territory or entering a new market or entering a new vertical, um, acquisition can be a really attractive thing to look at. And and you know, I've I've advised people on things like um, um, well, who's your, who's your biggest supplier? Do you want to buy them? Mm-hmm. So you've already got a relationship with these people. And, and then you buy the supplier. So you've, you've got a greater degree of control over your supply chain. 
Yeah. You've, you, you then can gather more intelligence on your competition because you know what they're buying from you. So do you find vertically integrating like that is more common than kind of no, going horizontal, horizontal integration is much more common. So, yeah. so I run a PR agency uh, and, and the exact, the exact case in the, in the one that I did. So, so we were owned by a New York based PR agency and they expanded into the UK and, and the chairman and I, the UK, Europe, UK chairman and I were given a brief to go out and buy agencies and we were given New York's checkbook, hmm. which was great fun. Um, but, but we were literally, so, so we went into Belgium and bought agencies. We went into Germany and bought agencies. We went into France and bought agencies. And we were negotiating deals in other countries when we got bought out by into public group. Wow. What, what do you think is the couple of the big things you learned being the one signing the checks? Like, like, you know, from the perspective of an entrepreneur wanting to sell, wanting to exit, you know, you've obviously been on the other side of that with checkbook. Yep. Um, you know, what, what are some of the lessons I suppose that you could bestow upon someone who has some, uh, some, some dreams of an exit one day, given, yep. you know, you've been that, you've been that buyer many times. Yes. Yes. Um, I think three, three big things immediately spring to mind. Uh, number one, if you're thinking about selling your business, if you want to sell your business in five years time, start working on it now. Don't think, oh, hey, I'm just going to sell my business tomorrow and it's going to be great. And someone's going to give me tons of money because that won't happen. Uh, and had you, you, need to have your, you need to have your business ready for sale. And had you found that with those businesses that you acquired when you were kind of given the blank checkbook and said, just go roll them all up, um, had you found that, that the ones that you bought had groomed themselves over the last five years? Some of them had, not all of them. Not all of them. But, but the, 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 ones that, the ones that commanded the higher prices definitely had. Got it. So they, were, so showing, they were showing a nice growth trajectory. They made sure they had contracts with all of their clients they made sure they had contracts with all of their staff and freelancers that everything. So, so we went in when we went in and did the due diligence and like, you know, here it all is. Everything is known. Um, you know, yes, we had this hiccup, but hiccups happen. But, you know, here it is. It's documented. It was discussed at this board meeting. So we went in and it's like, wow, these guys are really all over on and on top of their business. So, so really know what you've got and prepare it. So that when a, someone new comes in who doesn't know anything, it's very easy for them to, to get to grips with what's going on in the business. In your experience, and let's say two businesses, right? Um, both been in business for the same amount of time, both doing the same thing. So let's say PR, let's say they're both doing top line, same, same top line revenue, same bottom line profit. One of them's totally dialed in in terms of they got contracts for everything. They got a data room. They got the whole bit dialed, right? As opposed to a business, same same metrics, but they're all over the place, right? They don't have contracts. They they you know don't have consistent financials. You know, there's just weirdness kind of going on everywhere. Yeah. What would you say? would be the, the but, but you know, they got the revenue and they got the profit. What would that do to the valuation in terms of like a percentage differential, would you imagine? Off the top of my head. So with, with, within the PR industry, um, for most kind of standard PRs, I'm not, I'm not talking about like the really hot tech ones, but most standard PR businesses these days sell for anywhere from four to eight times EBITDA. Yeah. Um, the one that was prepared and ready and showing the thing would be, you know, they, they'd be up at the six, seven, eight range. And yeah. the one that was all over the place would be down at the four range. So it could yeah, right. be as much as double the valuation. Yeah, that's, that's huge, right? So, because I think when people are thinking of exit, they're really mostly thinking about revenue and profit, right? Yeah. And they're not really thinking systems, infrastructure, governance. Exactly. And, and yet, might be from the perspective of an yeah. of a new owner coming in, it's like, yeah. okay, what what are my risk factors and how do I mitigate them? Yeah. And if 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 the owner of the business has mitigated them already, that makes me feel a lot more comfortable. Because that's a huge force multiplier for let's say fifty percent just on good governance. Yeah. It's like you're doing all this work, sales, marketing, etc. Most most entrepreneurs aren't big fans of admin, and yet that admin slash governance layer is could be 50% of the value. Yep. <laughs> it's wild. Yep. Sorry. Really so that, 
first one. What, what are a couple of the others? Yeah. So the next one was was valuation. Be realistic about valuation. I would say ninety nine percent of entrepreneurs I meet think their business is worth way more than it really is. Um, so you know, if you're starting to think about selling, um, talk to your external accountant, talk to an advisor, talk to someone, and and have someone come in and give you an independent assessment that says, "Hey, I think this is what your business could be worth." You know, yeah. it might it might cost you five or ten grand in fees to get a, a valuation report done, but it enables you to approach the market much more realistically. And and you know, if I if I were to meet a business and 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 have the first couple of conversations and then say, okay, let's, let's sit down and, and, you know, talk seriously about the acquisition. And I'm thinking in my head, well, you know, this business is worth 3 million and the entrepreneur is thinking in their head, this business is worth 10 million. Hmm. You're not going to end up with much of a deal. And, and, and that was exactly the case in the example I gave earlier, where, where my client found a competitive business, we approached them, we made an offer that we thought was quite reasonable and they turned it down and and we actually went back and looked at the five years of financials and they were up and down and all over the shop and inconsistent and all that and 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 we wrote back to them and said you know we they we asked for the next level of detail and they came back and said can you give us an indicative price and we responded and said well it'll be a seven figure number most likely starting with a two so it's going to be between 2 and 3 million and they clearly thought it was going to be a lot worth a lot more than that and that would have been i mean that was on a that was already on a, a, a six times EBITDA. In about 10 years, I think we've had two or three, I think three independent, independent valuations like that for various reasons, shareholders and, and what have you, never seriously for an exit. But it's always been very interesting to work out from that objective perspective yep. where, the value, where someone sees the value lying in the business and where the gaps are, like yeah. where are the things that would cause it, and that's driven a significant amount of our strategy. Certainly over the last five years, yeah. um, not necessarily trying to groom dent to exit, but just getting that reflection around this is what is valuable, this is what is not, this is what you would need to develop to make it more valuable, and you know, more valuable businesses are better businesses. They run better, you know, they're Absolutely. more. Etc. So it it provides a, a really good it's a it's been a really good diagnostic I suppose for us to run every three years or so I think we've sort of ended up doing it yeah um, and that is always shaped strategy in the in the following in the following years what's number three uh, number three uh, is make sure you've got a good team in place uh, and again this is typically the situation so if you're the founder you're going to sell, you might be willing to stay on for a, a handover period, a year, two years, whatever. Um, but <clears throat> at some point, you're going to walk away from the business. As a buyer coming in, I want to know that the next level is capable of carrying on running so that as soon as you're not there, the whole thing doesn't fall over. And, and does it help to sort of demonstrate evidence? Because I've often, I've often said, and I'd like it either confirmed or denied by you, but I've often said that the, by the founder or the owner getting to the point where they can take three months off and actually having three months off out of the business, totally hands off, can do more for the value of their business than if they were just working in it day to day because it objectively demonstrates that they've got the systems, the team, you know, the, the, uh, the, the rhythm and the cadence for the business to run without them, which would prove to a potential acquirer, instead of having to sort of demonstrate it theoretically, you yeah. can actually say, you know, I went out camping with my with my family and kids for three months out in the never never, and uh, came came back and the business had uh, had grown more in that three months without me than it did with me. Exactly. Yeah. No. Hundred percent. And 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 being able to demonstrate that is is huge. And and you know, for some entrepreneurs, that's that's the scariest thing is to actually, oh my God, I, I'm letting go of my baby. And, and you know, I always oh. recommend if, if, if they'd not done it before, you know, take two weeks, but take two weeks off, turn your phone off, don't take your laptop with you and just let the business run for two weeks and see what happens. Humans are stupid, aren't we? It's like, what do you get into business for? Time and freedom and adventure and autonomy. And it's like, 
Why don't you go on a holiday? Because I just can't stop. You can totally stop. It's a multi-million dollar business, dude. It's working just fine. You've got a great team. No, I can't let it go. It's like, what is wrong with you, man? Yeah. Um, it can be quite addictive, can't it? I think the, oh, it the is. whole, yeah. It, it, it is. Addi- well, it's interesting. It's, it's, it can be addictive in a positive way when things are going well. And it can be addictive in a kind of a, um, you know, wrap around so, that running wheel when it's going badly, but it's just like, you know, you just, you're going faster and faster and faster and faster and you're going absolutely nowhere, but you don't know what else to do. do. And, and if you could just stop for a minute, that wheel will stop and kind of look around. Okay. I've got a problem here. I've got a problem here. I've got a problem here. Let's fix them. Yeah. But far too many entrepreneurs just there, they're on that, 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 um, What's that wheel? The hamster wheel. wheel. The hamster yeah. wheel. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the cortisol. <laughs> the cortisol. <wheel. laughs> so how, so let's say, okay. So let's say someone's listening and they're like, okay, you know, I, I think in my biggest supplier, maybe it's a printer or a this or a that or a data center or whatever it is. And it's like, okay, we could potentially do that. Or, or maybe they're a PR business or a, you know, a web or agency. A hairdresser. Or hairdresser. A hairdresser, and they're like, okay, well, there's another hairdresser across the street, you know, could do that and could do 10 of them, you know, and I could have every hairdresser in the, in the, you know, in this whole area. And I suppose most people would be able to think, okay, we could create some efficiencies with that. I've got a good accountant, they could do accounting for all of them. Um, you know, we've got a good booking system. All the others have got shit booking systems, so we could roll that in and, you know, so we could create some efficiencies there. Okay, great, great, great. Um, obviously, I want to take talk about how to fund it, but yep. but I'll, I'll, we'll get to there in a sec. When you say add and then multiply, yeah, right? So what you're saying is one plus one doesn't equal two, right? Well, what, so, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, is you can take one plus one to be two, but then multiply it by two and you've got four. So take your example of the hairdresser and all of the competitors have ship booking systems and, and they're not well run. And so you go out and you buy them on a low multiple of earnings. And yeah. then you put your model in and you successfully transition those businesses over the next two or three years. And all of a sudden, you let's say you bought, you bought let's just say for argument's sake, you bought a million dollars worth of, rev- of profit for three and a half million dollars. And then you structured everything properly and added it onto your uh, business um, where you're on say seven times earnings rather than three and a half times earnings. Well, all of a sudden that million dollars that you bought for three and a half is worth seven. Yeah. That would a require you to have a degree of scale and liquidity to know that you do in fact have a seven, a multiple of seven though. Right. Correct, which is why this strategy doesn't work for small startups because they've got to have that scale. Got it, right? But yeah, if you but, already- but they don't have to be huge. Like, you know, 10, 15 people, a million pounds in turnover, you can start from there. Yeah, okay, perfect. And so and so that's that's the real value. A, you get some economies of scale, right? Because we're now using more efficient systems and, and processes. And do you typically find that the acquirer and, and let's say a business that might be doing this for the first time, do you typically find that they've got some unique IP, like they know their shit, like we've got a better way of doing it. So if we roll it into that business, it's going to make that business better. Like we've got some unique IP, we've got a better booking system, like whatever that is. Do yeah. you find that typically the case or are they acquiring that? Well, they can do that as well. Um, I would say that's that's getting at the next level of, a, of advanced thing where you're actually going out and finding someone who's got what you want and it's cheaper to buy it than to go out and create well, it yourself. You got to be pretty big for that. You, you, you prefer to buy someone that's got the clients and the distribution or they've got something, but you're getting it at a discount because they're not doing enough of the things right. Exactly. Exactly. As you called it, that force multiplier. And by you going in and fixing those things, it lifts the whole yeah. You know, ju- just on on its own, it lifts the whole. And then you've got the possibility, not so much in the let's buy 10 hairdressers, but let's buy, you know, let's buy eight hairdressers and a company that makes hair care products and a PR agency that specializes in the hair and beauty industry. 
And then all Got of a sudden you you can you can then say, right, well, we're now going to put all of these products into into our eight salons. And we're going to get fantastic coverage about how wonderful our salons are because we've got a PR agency doing it for us. And that's all part of our group. Really so requires. Kind of, it's like find the ecosystem. Really requires someone to, to see a much bigger, like really to think in ecosystem thinking. And it's like, okay, I'm, I'm not in the business of cutting hair anymore. I'm in the business of actually building a group of businesses right and so yeah. so i guess the like the money right because again i think one of the big reasons that would make people not even consider that um certainly in the in the lower levels is they just don't have millions of dollars sloshing around in the, in the bank accounts right, right. i mean you got to get to a point we've got a pretty damn big business before you've got a million bucks in cash that's yep. not encumbered in some way that you could yep. just go and buy you for a million bucks. And even if you did, that's a lot of opportunity cost to put into, you yep. know, this, this entity that's going to yield over, you know, potentially a long time. Yep. So I guess, how do you circle that square? What, what, are, the, what are the typical mechanisms for, for funding or for simply the, the value exchange of the acquisition that you find a, but most most common, most interesting, most exciting. So, I mean, there's 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 kind of three different ways that you could look at it. Um, the first way um, is you can do what's called a share for share exchange. So, hey, I've got my company. I like your company. Do you want to be part of my group and have have it be something bigger? And I'll take your hundred shares in your company and give you fifty shares in mine. Yep. And and it's and so no cash trades hand, but 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 there's still value. And that person now becomes a substantial shareholder in your company um, and will play a role probably on the board and be involved in strategic decision making and things like that. So where you've got a business where you want to keep the owner tied in, that's a great way of doing it um, and without, without having to, to put the cash out. Then when you're looking at having to spend that, cash. You'd have, to, you'd have to A, demonstrate. So, so just trying to, for someone listening, right, to get their head around, why would someone do that, right? Yep. Why, why would someone, so let's, let's say there's a business worth, you know, 10 million, right? And then there's a business worth 1 million independently yep. valued, right? And the idea is, well, let's roll your 1 million into the group. You'll have 10% of our bigger group, right? Yep. And, and away we go. Yep. Why and, you'll have, and you'll have access, you'll have access to all of our customers, Yep. And you'll have access to our supply chain that might be able to, pr to procure whatever the inputs are at a better price because we've got scale. But you'd, they'd still need to see that there's some future, there's either a lot of short-term personal cash benefit to them or a future equity benefit to them, like, like roll into this group, we're going to do this three or four more times and then we're going to sell the thing for 10x. Exactly. Of, yep. of which your current million-dollar business on its own are you going to ten? Are you going to be able to sell that for ten x in the next five years? No chance. Yep. Right. Roll into the group. Here's our strategy. Do you typically find part of the acquisition using that model is based on the blue sky strategy of what it's worth after the roll up? Definitely, definitely. And and you often see that in in industry consolidation plays where you know and the, and this is something that is often done in in with with backing from private equity houses. Um, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll find someone who's, I mean, I've, I've, I'm aware of a couple of groups in the UK in the, in the dental sector where mm. they're buying dental practices and they've got backing from a big private equity house who's just said, right, we're going to allocate resources. We've decided there's a lot of potential in this industry. Um, we've teamed up with someone who's already acquired five practices and, and we've given them the checkbook and they're going to go out and buy 20 more. And then we're going to sell it to one of the major global players in the dental industry. So yeah. that, that's definitely a route. And, and as you gain, as you gain, gain a, a track record and, and, and can demonstrate what you're doing, you could well find that you can approach private equity and say, Hey, I'm looking at doing a consolidation in this sector um, you know, will you back me? Um, you, to, to do that, you're probably needing to be at kind of the 5 million plus revenue size because, because you, you need to have demonstrated that you can do it a bit yourself and then get their firepower. But in the meantime, 
you know, you can find private investors who are interested in backing you. You can, you can, if if you've got a, a business model that has proven cash generation um, track record, you can often uh, get debt funding in place, uh, or you can get a, a combination of debt and equity funding in place so that you can. Where would you get the debt from? I so I have relationships with a couple of specialist lending firms um, that focus on providing debt for acquisitions. It used okay. to be that you'd go down to the bank, but <laughs> these days banks don't do that anymore. Um, but yeah, no. It, so there, there are specialist uh, lending uh, firms who who provide acquisition finance, um, and 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 so it's all about having relationships with them. Yeah. So it's either a share swap debt or anything else. Equity. So sell some equity to somebody. So so maybe you 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 might you might go out to some angel investors and say, look, I'm looking at doing this. I need to raise half a million in cash. Um, would you like Love to it. buy a, a portion of, of my company and 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 be in in the group for an extended period of time? Okay. So instead of a share swap, someone else is effectively coming in, buying shares, giving you the cash, and then you're taking yeah. that cash. And then you're something. taking that cash and buying the company. The, the other thing to bear in mind is you can always structure a deal where there's some cash now and there's some cash later. And, and oftentimes, particularly where the owner of the business you're acquiring, where you want them to stay in, it's good to have a structure like that. So let's say the purchase price is a million bucks. I'll give you half a million on day one. And in two years time, I'll give you the other half a million. But if you've grown the business and achieved certain things, you could make even more than that. Yeah. So the kind of the, the earn out concept. Exactly. Right? Exactly. It's like there's a carrot, but there's also a bloody big stick because if it goes the other way, yep. you, know, you, don't get your, you don't get your second tranche. Correct. Um, <clears throat> you've done really well building yourself as the, the key person of influence. I mean, you've really ticked all the boxes, so to speak in terms of, you know, the, the author, the speaker, the award winner, the TEDx talker, you know, the, the, the joint venture partnershipper, if you like. Like you've really just sort of taken this and put it together, I suppose, quite beautifully. Could you, I'm just curious, like blank slate, if you were sort of to unpack the journey, where, where was the first point granted, you came across Dan, came across Dan in the UK, but, you know, people come across Dan all the time and don't decide to apply anything he talks about, right? Yeah. Um, so what, what was it that kind of made you go, this is the right strategy? Because there's plenty of venture capitalists, there's plenty of people in the investment space that are not doing this, um, yeah. that are not leading from the front, that are not trying to build their brand. In fact, they're probably actively trying to do the opposite to a large degree and, and let the money do the talking. So what, what is it about you that that caused you to, to take that path, do you think? That's a really good question. Um, to quite a large degree, and, and, I, and I know you're into your meditation and I'm into my meditation, and, and so you'll, you'll get this. People who aren't into meditation might not understand, but it felt right. Yeah. And when I was meditating about it, I was calm. My brain wasn't all over the shop. It was just like, I would, I would go into a meditation and think about it. And it was just, I would come out of that meditation and just feel calm and feel that, yeah, I know I'm on the right path or maybe, oh, well, I got to look at this or I got to look at that, but it, it, it felt right. So uh, that was kind of the overriding thing. And then it was a case of, you know, then letting my logical brain sort of look and, and, and kind of join the dots, but you can't join the dots looking forward. You can only join the dots from behind you. And, you know, I, I just look at certain events in my life and, and, you know, I talk about some of them in, in the book, like um, when I was uh, when I was 14 years old, I took out a bank loan. Um, I was into coin collecting and I grew up in Canada and the, the Canadian Mint did a, a big thing, commemorative coin set to, to commemorate the Montreal Olympics in 1976. And I really wanted this coin set, but I only had one hundred dollars and it was three hundred. And I remember complaining to my dad and saying, you know, I, I really want this. And, and, and he said, well, let's go down to the bank and, and see if we can get you a loan. And so my dad and I went down to the bank back in the days when banks did that. And, and you know, obviously my dad countersigned it. So the bank knew the risk was pretty low. 
But there I am, 14 years old, signing a document, you know, and I explained to the bank manager, I, I had a newspaper round and I got this much money every month and I could afford to pay this back. And, and, and so I borrowed $200 and paid it off over two years. And I didn't know it at the time, but when I was 16 years old, I had a credit record. So, you know, <laughs> and, and then, and then some of the m a stuff um i mean I, I i i trained as a chartered accountant with pwc and then i left them and i was working for a big computer company called ncr and ncr got taken over by at t uh the u.s telecoms giant and um like i didn't really know anything about it but i i, I was fascinated by what was going on and this was one of those mega mergers that went really really badly wrong because it was two totally different cultures and just having been through that experience, then when I got involved in being more on the driving side of M&A, I was always really, really attentive about culture and how do we make sure that these companies are going to fit together. And that's why I say, you know, don't go out and buy your fiercest competitor because you hate them and they hate you. And, and you can't just all of a sudden say to everybody, right, we're now one big happy family. And it was, yeah, it was moments like that in my life that just led to these, led to these points. Um, and, and, you know, I mentioned this lunch I've got today with, with, with John and Angela. I haven't seen Angela since, um, well, since before the pandemic. And I've got a copy of my book all ready for her. Uh, and she's the one who introduced me and John. And, and I've written on the inside of the book to Angela if it wasn't for you, this wouldn't have happened. Because she introduced us at that point in time 20 years ago. But there's something in you that made you decide to become the author, the speaker. Like, that's not an accident, right? That's a decision. <clears throat> yes, true. Everything I learned on KPI really resonated with me. I just, I could see the logic in it. Um, and in fact, I remember that was the first time I'll say I met you rather than you and I met because you came you came across to the UK. This would have been October or November of 2015. And you came in and, and, and were a guest speaker at one of our KPI sessions. And I remember just thinking, wow, this is so cool. And, and, and hearing, you know, having heard it from Dan and then hearing it from you. And here's the perspective from Australia. And, and I remember coming out of your session. I think I'd taken about 15 pages of notes. Because it was just, it was really compelling. And it was like, I got it. And, yeah, and I find for people that it resonates with, it's just a no-brainer, right? And I think, um, you know, there's no, there's no one way to do business. But typically, I find the people that really gel with, with this strategy, uh, there's, the, the common theme seems to be someone that wants to do something of worth, of merit, of impact beyond money. Yes. Right? Yes, because absolutely. And this could be a bias as well, but typically I find the people that are building businesses from behind the scenes, they don't want to be known, they don't want to be invisible. Typically they don't have a compelling vision, mission or purpose because if you do, it tends to exude itself out. Like you can't shut up about it you want to talk about it and the moment you got a business that's doing something and it's like well that could be a platform for that and it all just becomes very obvious and then all of a sudden you're you know um you're the you know you're the the the, the richard branson with his virgin private equity firm as opposed to every other no-name private equity firm that, you know, you just, who's the founder of that, so to speak. Um, and I guess I'm always just fascinated around that inflection point where people gravitate to it. But one of the things I've always got from you is, I mean, you're effectively a money man, but you've always had a really deep commitment to impact. Yeah, definitely. Where do you reckon that came from? I was never the most popular kid at school, but I was always looking out for people who were the underdog and what could I do to help them? And I, I guess that probably came from my own upbringing. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm the youngest of four kids. I'm, I'm 10 years younger than the eldest. I'm four years younger than the next sibling. Um, and, and I grew up in a, 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 a quite a noisy family. Um, and, and, you know, you had to, you had to shout to be heard. 
And I guess just all of the impact of that, when I then went out and saw people who weren't being heard, I wanted to reach out and help them. And, and I've always, I've always kind of had a bit of a soft spot for people that I've felt, you know, hang on, something's not right. That's not fair. Um, and to kind of bring it back full circle to the work I'm doing with funding focus. Now it's like, I've now discovered this on a global scale mm. and it's, and it's that, it's that really deep seated abhorrence of, of unfairness. How did the Ted talk come about? That was a really cool story. So I was, um, when I published the book, I, I have a, a, a good friend, uh, entrepreneur friend of mine, and, and we met up for a coffee and he had just taken on a uh, entrepreneur in residence role at Pearson Business College here in London, um, which is a business school. This is a subsidiary of Pearson, the big education group. And um, he said, oh, why don't you come into Pearson and, and do your book launch there? And I thought, oh, that sounds cool. And so I went in and met some of the people and we ran the book launch. And then I got invited to one of their industry days. Um, and when you're a speaker at their industry days, one of the students on the program introduces you. And this young chap called Thibaut um, introduced me. And I thought, wow, he'd done a really cool job and reached out to him afterwards. And we went and had lunch and started talking. And, and I, I then hired him uh, and he still works with me. Um, and then he told me that he had always had a dream of becoming a TEDx organizer. And he convinced Pearson College uh, to set up the TEDx. And, and he said, you know, he made me go through the application process and I had to compete with others. Um, but he said, he said, I want you to tell your story. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I got the TEDx because <laughs> I hired the organizer. <laughs> and, but, but still, I mean, the, the, even just the title, The Fight for Fairer Funding, I mean, it doesn't get more perfect than that given you know, the conversation we've had. I mean, talk about a talk, talk about a, a keynote talk, if you like, that couldn't be more on brand or on point. Yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent. And and it's been it's been fantastic. And, and you know, again, thinking about what you say in terms of the, the, the whole KPI journey and stuff, the, the credibility that that gives you. Um, you know, and I've been able to reach out as a result of that and, and, and connect with some fairly high profile people. Yeah. You, you do a bunch of coaching as well for the dent community, which is awesome. What, what would you say is some of the, so there's going to be a bunch of KPIs listening to this. And yeah. so what the acquisition part might be a bit out of their league, I suppose. Right. Cause to get to the, you know, you probably got about oh, 10, 15%, I would suppose of our community that are at the level where they would have that momentum ready for acquisition. So let's say the majority aren't ready, but it's obviously interesting to learn. What do you find of, of, of some of the, I guess, the key challenges that people have, Let, let's say in their first 12 months going through KPI, either stuff that you experienced as well and, and you now noticed others experiencing it. What are some of the common themes that you find? Um, I think some of the key themes are, that there's always a bit of a sense of overwhelm. It's a bit like drinking from a fire hose. And I know it's deliberately designed that way. Um, but, you know, I always find, particularly in the first one or two coaching sessions that I do with the groups, that just calming them down and just accepting that, you know, you're going to get overwhelmed with stuff. You don't have to get it all perfect 100% first time round. You know, I mean, I've, I've, I've been doing it for six years and I'm, I, it's now working but you know, I've I've had plenty of ups and downs on on the way, and and that's okay. It, you know, as 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 one of the dent maxim goes, you know, directionally correct and prolific beats perfect every time. I find I find a good analogy is like getting in an ice bath. You just kind of gotta, yeah, hold the line. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's in, but it's good for you. Yeah, it is good for you, and 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 you know follow the process. It works. You know, it, it, the, the number of people I've seen from a wide, wide range of different industries, different backgrounds, different kinds of companies who just follow the process and, and see their business take off. And, and the ones who just kind of 
you know, quietly disappear. Well, they haven't followed the process. Yeah, I often find people want to complicate it, right? Instead of just doing the simple things, it's like, yeah, but how's the funnel going to connect to the double opt-in, down-sell, up-sell, cross-sell thing? It's like, you know, just just get your pitch right. Trust us. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, no kidding. No kidding. And 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 again, you know, an, an example of that, and you may have seen it. I, I posted this in, in the group recently. I, I, I'm working with one client and, and we were involved in an accelerator program and um, we had to deliver an elevator pitch. And mine was voted the best elevator pitch out of 35. It was it was exact because it was name, same, claim to fame, aim, game done you know and everybody else was kind of trying to condense five minutes of content into 30 seconds and i knew i didn't have to do that i just i had to grab their attention give the credibility boom close it and 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 there we are and i yeah. and, and i you know and, and and i don't mean this is blowing my own trumpet but like i got 50 percent more votes than the second place person you are a white male <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> um, and so from your business model perspective, like how how does David Horde make money? And I say that not just as a like I'm curious about your actual business model, but also from the perspective that if someone's listening to this and they potentially could acquire a business and they are in that position and this has got them thinking, et cetera. So, so I'm curious, how do, how does that, how does your world work from that perspective? I'm sure you have some consulting and you've got some other things going on. Yeah. So, so typically I do, I do consulting work with companies that are thinking about it, preparing, getting ready. Um, and then when they're actually going through either a fundraising or an M&A transaction or an exit, um, I charge a fee that's based on the percentage of the value of the deal. And I take 10% of that fee as an upfront retainer, just to give me some cash flow. But 90% of that fee is contingent on the deal actually happening. That's so pretty if, cool. for example, I'm, if for example, I'm helping someone raise 2 million, um, then the fee is 5%, which is hundred grand. I take 10 grand as a, as a fee upfront. If we don't successfully get the raise away, it doesn't cost them any more. I've been compensated for my time, um, but if we get the raise successfully away, then you know the ninety grand gets paid to me. And whilst that sounds like a big chunk of money, you've just raised a million quid, so you can afford it. Yeah, absolutely. And not only that, but it's it skews the risk to after the deal has been. Well, you know the the risk, it, but it, but if the risk was just like pay it all up front, and then we'll see what happens. It's like obviously there's a lot of a lot of risk there. Whereas yeah. you know you're clearly backing yourself because you've obviously got a good track record of getting these deals away. Um, was that just an intuitive pricing structure or did that, was, was there an evolution there? So the, the, the percentages are, are pretty much driven by the marketplace um, and, and what others are charging. Um, and then my model of 10% upfront and the balance at the back end was something that felt right to me because I've always wanted people to feel that I'm on their side and, and only when they are successful, am I successful? So, so, so the retainer fee kind of compensates me for my time, but if they're successful, then I share in their success. And if they're not successful in, in, I say they, we, um, if we're not successful in, in delivering it, then I'm not taking any more fee from them. Meditation. Um, I'm always curious to explore, you know, especially someone who, is a leader and a business owner and et cetera, that also has a, a kind of um, a practice, if you like. Um, how did you get into it? What do you do? How does it benefit you? Um, you know, I just, I just love a bit of that perspective because for me, I don't know how what I do. I, I do not know how I would live without it mm. now. Um, it's almost like, I'm, I'm doing this because it's like brushing your teeth. I, I couldn't imagine, like, I, I meditate twice a day, every day, 20 minutes, bang, bang, bang. And not doing it would be like not cleaning my teeth. Like I yeah. can feel it. Yeah. So I dabbled with meditation in my late teens, early twenties, and then kind of lost interest and then started again, probably 
five or six years ago, a friend of mine said, oh, there's this cool app called Headspace. You should give it a try. And I gave it a try and ran with Headspace for maybe a year and then got a little bit bored of it. And then um, was talking to another friend and she said, you know, just kind of do your own practice. Here's some books you can read. And I've just developed my own practice. So literally the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I sit up in bed. I pull the covers up to my shoulders and I close my eyes and I've got a timer on my phone with a, a wave motion sound and it runs for 15 minutes. And then I get out of bed and I sometimes if something's big and on my mind, I'll meditate around it. Most days I just let my mind go where it goes. Hmm. And, and so any technique at all, breath or mantra or anything, or you just sit there quietly and let it go? I, I, I think because I did the, the whole headspace thing for a year, I kind of developed something along the lines of, of what Andy Puttacombe, the founder of that does. And, and so there, there's an element of breath. There isn't a mantra. Um, there's definitely an element of breath. The, the other thing that I've discovered, so I, I run three times a week and I just, I, I go down to my local, um, my local park. So I run from my home down to a local park and do a bunch of laps around the park and then come back home. It takes about an hour and I take my glasses off. So, I mean, I, I, I you know, I can still see you sort of, you're a bit blurry, uh, but I don't need to read things when I'm running. I only have to cross the road once. Um, and, and I don't take any music or anything with me. I'm just out in nature. And I find that whole hour is also very meditative. Mm. That one, I tend to be a little bit more structured. Like um, I might go into a run thinking, okay, I've got a thorny problem and I'm just going to run around and my brain will come up with ideas and solutions. And it's remarkable when, when you, when you let your brain calm down, the wisdom comes through. Isn't it right? So I've, I was introduced to the Vedic tradition of, of meditation, which is essentially a, it's essentially TM transcendental yep. meditation, right? Just without the, there was a, a, an offshoot where TM got too political, got too yep. institutional, et cetera. And so Vedic meditation is just trying to get back to the, what well, has just got back to the, the purity of the teaching, but twice a day mantra. And the thing I'd never really connected to the word charm before right but but sort of my my teacher introduced me to this idea of of charm of of desire right and often like if we're not meditating and we're just running through our life reacting as a bit of an automaton then our desires can be very much driven by the ego right i want money yep. i want power i want fame i want sex i want or um, I want to not feel small i want to not feel powerless i want to not feel insecure and so then we see our desire for the Ferrari or the Tesla or the watch or the business or the girl or the this or the that or the I want that table at the restaurant or this restaurant and, with the, and like this life and all that kind of accoutrement to kind of acquire things that feel like desires, but they are the desires of the ego, right, as opposed to to drop into a state of meditative consciousness where you you slip beneath or above whatever that kind of ego state yes to connect to this natural place and and nature really doesn't struggle to grow right you look at you look at the natural ecosystem as much as we're doing our best to pull it apart and you know you've got the most sophisticated intelligence allowing this mother nature if you like to bloom and to work and to thrive yep. in some of the most adverse conditions come along and fuck it up <laughs> well because i think we're in this separate ego space we yes. we see ourselves as separate to nature yep. as opposed to certainly my experience has been dropping in and and what the the teachers of the technique suggest is that when you come out of that, you are just subtly impregnated with intention from nature. And so yes. now desire yes. or intuitions are no longer driven by ego. They're actually driven by a natural impulse yep. that is desiring for us to be its perfect expression 
given out in the same thing that in the same way that no tree is the same, you can have two eucalyptus trees and they'll both grow in totally different ways. You and me, we're humans. We both grow in totally different ways based on our natural expression. And the more that you and I can get into that space of consciousness, the more that kind of natural impulse drives us to purpose. And I think it's just curious that, you know, you mentioned, I'm like, you know, why did you go down this KPI line? And you're like, well, meditation, it just felt good, right? There's just this natural impulse that seems to, to, uh, for me at least, that has seemed to move me to much better decisions and to actions or even inaction that just tends to cause not even good or bad things to occur, but the right things to occur if that makes sense. I'd just be curious as to your your thoughts or, or perspective on any of that. I've done a lot of reading around it over the last 10 years. Um, and, and I believe that, you know, there is, there is an intelligence behind life. Um, I describe it as cosmic energy. Um, lots of people can describe it in whatever they, whatever way they choose to. Um, but, but yeah, yeah. You know, some people call it God or religion or whatever. And, you know, and that's cool. I think I, it's, it's really interesting actually having read all the things I have read and learned a bit about different religions of the world and, and at their very core, most religions are all about the same thing. Um, and, and, and it's, yeah, it's, it's that wisdom behind life, you know, why does why does an acorn become an oak tree and and you know even even to take something strangely topical like like the omicron variant of covid well that's just life trying to find a new way of expressing itself because humanity has created vaccines that have stopped its spread so it's got to sure. try something else i've got to adapt it's like uh you know if you take too many antibiotics well, it's gonna it's gonna adjust, and we make you know super bugs because they're trying to evolve away from the antibiotics. Same yeah. thing with viruses and yeah, and, and your gut health gets really bad if you take too many antibiotics and all that kind of stuff. Now, yeah. you know, mother mother nature kind of knows what the right balance for long term sustainability is. Yeah, yeah, we we got to listen a little bit more. Yeah. Do you find, do you know many other founders, business owners? Are you finding it's becoming with things like Headspace, et cetera, more popular in your circles that people is, are yes. taking that time? Yeah, it is. The switched on ones get it and understand and 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 realize. And it's, I, 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 I think you put it really nicely. It's, it's like moving to a level that isn't the ego. Mm. And, and. I also believe that, you know, when you come from that place that isn't the ego, you're tapping into a wider energy field and opportunities present themselves to you. And I think the reason that I, because I also did a lot of dabbling with meditation when I was a kid. Um, so early 20s, I did about 30 days worth of silent meditation with Vipassana and things of that nature. But again, it didn't stick. Like I didn't, well, not it, not it didn't stick. I didn't stick to it. Right. Part of it was because of this sort of concept of renunciation that, I, that like, if I was to be a, like a spiritual person that like meditated, then I would like have to not desire things and that, 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 that to have a desire for things to happen in the world was in some way anti-spiritual, if that makes sense. And yep. so, and I was like, eh. Whereas I think what I've what I've really got is it's like no 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 quite the opposite, right? By by dropping into a space of consciousness, coming out and going, what desire is blooming? That is actually recognizing the natural impulse to grow, to expand, to live your purpose. Yeah. Um, I, I don't see people. I often come across people that are like, I'm trying to work out my purpose. Like it's a logical thing they're thinking through. Right. And it's like, no, like you're not seeing a tree going, God, should I, should I grow a branch over here? Or like, ugh. like it's a purpose or this natural expression of who we're meant to be in the world. I just don't think it's something you can think through. I think it's a, it's a conundrum. It's something that needs to be felt, experienced. And, you know, th this concept of fearlessly seeking charm, right? You get this impulse to act and it might be scary and it might be well out of your comfort zone, yeah. but 
you know, what a, what a wild adventure. If you could go back, just by way of bringing us home, if you could go back and pick a time in your entrepreneurial career where you could go back and give yourself a piece of advice, right, that would, that would adjust your trajectory in some way, number one, where would you go back to? And number two, what would you say? I'm going to answer that in a slightly roundabout way. Part of me says I would go back to when I had my midlife crisis and launched my wine business because it was a disaster. Um, it was great fun, but I mean, it wasn't a disaster. I, I learned a hell of a lot, um, uh, but it was economically not very <laughs> successful. Um, but actually thinking back on it, I needed to go through that experience because that was, my, that was the beginning of my entrepreneurial journey. I'd, I'd always worked for other people before then. And, and so I had to kind of realize that, you know, yeah, it's, it is a big, bad world out there and you got to find your way and it's, you know, it's not easy. Um, so I wouldn't change that. <sighs> what would I do? I actually think I'd do it all over again. You know, there were good days and bad days, but, but I learned from every single day, you know, maybe I could have done some things faster, some things slower bits and bobs, but I've, I mean, I've always viewed life as a journey and it's, it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. I love it. Perfect way to bring it home, mate. How can people get you? How can people get add then multiply? Give us all the deets. So add then multiply is available on Amazon in uh, paperback, uh, Kindle. It's on audible. Uh, I read it. Um, so as long as you've got access to one of those anywhere in the world, you can get the book. Um, the website is add then multiply.com. Um, the, um, and, and there's a contact form for people to reach me. Uh, my Twitter is David B Horn. Um, and I'm on LinkedIn and my LinkedIn is David B Horn and I'm very happy to connect with anyone and have a chat. Beautiful, mate. I just want to say thank you for your time. There was so much gold in that, such a lot of value, such a lot of insight and such a lot of generosity from your perspective. So, uh, David Horn, thank you for your time. Thank you for being on the Den Podcast. Thanks, Glenn. Really enjoyed it. For all of you tuning in, all you got to do now is go make a dent in the universe. <laughs>